Hi, everybody, and welcome to our third Parapsychology uh, Australia online conference. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. My name is Joyce Bock. I will be the host or MC today. Yeah, so welcome, everybody. Um, I am the Vice President of the Australian Institute of Parapsychological Research, or the AIPR, and we are a non-profit organisation. So con conferences like these will help us run. So thank you, everybody, for purchasing a ticket. <laughs> uh, all proceeds go to AIPR and keeping us afloat, so thank you. I'm really, really excited. We've got a range of um, really interesting topics today. So it's research in sacred spaces, the latest in ghost uh, research in ghost episodes, near-death experiences, psychic skeptics, paranormal investigations. Yeah, so a whole smorgasbord of para paranormal experience or parapsychology um, uh, topics. All right, so um, I think we've got Vlad, uh, Dr. Vladimir Dubai, who is the president of the ARPR, who wants to, yeah, maybe he could say a few words. Yeah, <clears throat> just um, just a couple of quick words. A warm welcome to everyone who's who's coming today. Um, as Joyce mentioned, that some of the talks here are going to be really interesting. Um, actually, all of them are going to be really interesting. Uh, ghosts, NDEs, they're very close to my heart. Precognition, what James is going to be talking about. Again, that's something I've been looking into um, the last couple of years. And sacred spaces as well. Um, that's something I kind of, that concept came across to me when I was reading a series of books called Seth, Seth Speaks, uh, Media Mystic um, Kind of Communication. And they were talk, also mentioning the possibility that certain locations have got uh, extra energy and so on. So the talks themselves are going to be um, very good. In terms of a little bit of background about the, the Parapsychology Australia online conferences, they, they were born essentially because of COVID. Um, the Australian Institute of Parapsychological Research um, had usual annual conferences based in Sydney where we would have little mini conferences, but because of COVID and the lockdowns, things would naturally progress to online. And it's actually working really well with the on online talks. Um, you can get people from all over the world to come and attend and also to, to present. Um, so it's, yeah, it seems to be working very well. Joyce has been doing a lot of that in, in terms of organizing the events through her organization, Salubrious Events. Um, for those who don't know what AIPR is, it's um, Australia-based non-for-profit organization. Um, it's, we've got our own journal. Uh, we pub publish peer-reviewed um, articles. Um, we have uh, certificate courses. People can undertake courses in parapsychology. Um, we have um, an online forum where people can post questions and ask you know, for advice and assistance. A um, whole, whole range of parapsychology-related resources um, on AIPR uh, website. So... <clears throat> And so under that umbrella, we also have that, that Parapsychology Australia um, online conference, which is what's happening today, to try and disseminate some of that information to the public. So I'm hoping that, um, yeah, today's sessions will all be really, really enjoyable and informative. All right, thank you. Thank you, Vlad. Just a, few, a couple of announcements as well, really, uh, sorry that um, Sarah Lemos, one of our speakers, couldn't make it today. And also James Horan, uh, he's yes, quite sick. Uh, but luckily, Brian, his partner in crime, can do the whole speech. <laughs> Just quickly, I'll introduce some of our core committee members. Uh, we've got Rob Tilly, our resident Ghostbuster. He's been Ghostbusting for many, many years. Hi, Rob. Did you want to say hello? <laughs> He's got 85% uh, success rate. Uh, that's 88%, uh, Joy. 88% success rate. Oh, 88. Oh, I'm sorry. 88. <laughs> yes, and that was from a survey done by Lance. Yeah, Lance Storm and I uh, did a project. We had 30 people 
who asked for help clearing haunted houses and uh, the truck possession case and uh, some other poltergeist cases and uh, I was able to help uh, most of them. There were the tests that uh, Lance drew up showed that none of these people had any mental illness and every one of them had a long history of psychic experiences. So it seemed as though it's only psychic people that have psychic experiences. Mm, very interesting. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> Okay. Nice to see you. Lance, um, he's our resident academic in parapsychology. Did you want to say hello, Lance? Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. Yeah, nice to see you all. Hope the weather is better in your area. It's a bit cloudy okay. and cold at the moment, surprisingly, for summer. <laughs> yes, it is cold too in WA. Yep. Nice to see you, Lance. All right, well, we might get started and I'd like to introduce our first speaker, John Cruz. Uh, he'll be talking about the power of place, the creation of sacred spaces. Just a little bit about John. Let me get his bio. Uh, so John Cruz is the founder and executive director of the Rhine Research Center. He's, he has over 20 years of professional technology experience and over 10 years as a professional researcher, pro providing a unique insight into the integration of technology and parapsychological research. His research includes explorations into subtle energies of the body, including psychic healing, the energy behind psychokinesis, poltergeist activity and other unconscious efforts. Oh, sorry, effects on electronic devices and measurements of biophotons or ultraviolet light from energy healers. So it's my great pleasure to introduce John. Hi, Joyce. Hi, hi, Thank John. <laughs> I, I want to I say I'm not the founder of the Rhine Research Center. <laughs> oh, sorry. I thought I'd... <laughs> but I did found the Rhine Education Center. I, which, okay. is, which is a component. Ah. Um, I, I wouldn't want to take the word or the the credit for what JB Ryan did, but we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Great. So thank you very much for inviting me here today. I want to thank Joyce and Lance um, who contacted me and asked me if I'd like to speak here today. Uh, I'm always excited about speaking to new audiences, and this is about the furthest away we could possibly be from each other. <laughs> I'm at the Ryan Research Center in Durham, North Carolina, on the east coast of the United States. Um, I don't know. I guess there are things that are further from Australia than this, but uh, this is a pretty, pretty long distance. Uh, and it's appropriate because we're going to be talking about places today. And I want to discuss a little bit about different places and sacred sites and sacred spaces and, well, how they might come into being. But let me get started. And uh, I'm just going to tell you who I am, because most of you I haven't met before. I'm the executive director of the Ryan Research Center. Uh, I've been the executive director for oh, about 12, 10 or 12 years now. I can't even remember. It's been a while. For about 11 years, I think it's been. <laughs> um, I'm the education director and founder of the Ryan Education Center, which is what Joyce was saying a minute ago. Um, I've been a researcher at the Ryan since 2009. I have degrees in philosophy and technology and also in psychological research and analysis methods. And um, I informally studied psi and parapsychology for over 35 years. Now, this is my professional introduction to things I do, but let me tell you about who I am. You know, my background, I grew up in a family of people who were doing healing work. My mom was a healer. Her mom did healing work. Her mom did healing work, and it went back generations. And I found out later in my life that my dad also <laughs> came from a family that did healing work. I didn't know that until I was an adult. But as I was growing up, when I was just small, very small, all of the things related to healing were around us all the time. Things about ESP. When I was a kid, we got a, uh, an ESP test kit for Christmas. 
when I was probably about seven years old. And it wasn't anything new to us because we've been talking about these sorts of things for a lot of years. Uh, I learned meditation, hypnosis, and visualization techniques, and we used them as a family with all my brothers and sisters. When I was probably about, you know, four, not exaggerating, four or five years old, we were doing meditation and visual, creative visualization together. So I have a long history of experiences, and I never could find a good way to explain it to my friends. Because when I got to be a teenager, I realized that a lot of them didn't understand <laughs> what I was talking about when I talked about hypnosis or visualization. And I didn't understand why, because it was something we did all the time. When I started to try to determine how can I explain this to them, my dad was an engineer. So I thought, well, maybe if I learned how to talk about it in scientific terms, it would help other people to learn more about them and understand it. And so that's what led me to, after many years of traveling, going in different directions, to the Rhine and getting into parapsychology research. So that just give you a little sense of who I am and where I'm coming from. But today we're talking about spaces. And oh, well, I, I put this in here because this was a space I found when I was at a museum one day and I thought, wow, this is such a cool place. It really spoke to me for a few reasons. One of them being that, um, well, it was it was a really dark room and it had this blue lights all over. And one of the things I study is ultraviolet light, ultraviolet light emissions from people. And I was like, this is just, it really felt right to me. And not only that, but it kind of says, which is what I kind of think a ghost might say if you had a ghost around. So, and I put this little picture of the guy with the cat because it's just, it's always confuses me when I look at it and I thought it was cool. So I'm just going to move on. But um, what we're going to do today is we're going to go to a few different places. We're going to start with some famous landmarks and just, just talk a little bit about how landmarks uh, might become sacred. We're going to go to Dallas and New Orleans and a little bit more. Uh, well, I'll take you to the Rhine Laboratories and walk you through a little bit about the Rhine Research Center and our labs, and then discuss a little bit about the research on the power of place and finish up with a little bit about connections. So let's get started. These are all different. You might be familiar with some of these spaces. These are some spaces where, what is a sacred space? You know, these are all things, places that some people have considered sacred for any number of reasons. But what does that mean, a sacred space? You know, we can often talk about um, religious locations, churches. I mean, we have Notre Dame here, which is, you know, a, which is a church or was for a long time uh, before it burned. But these, those are spaces that many people consider sacred because they go to worship. worship. But some of these other places are don't have the same that people don't go there to worship necessarily. But when they go there, a lot of times they feel a connection to the place. They have feelings there. Sometimes it's about the history of the place. They can think about, oh, you know, I learned about this in school. I know about it. But sometimes it's more than just the history that is affecting them. You know, it's not like it's not that they go there and they might be overwhelmed with these feelings and emotions of things they learned in the past that are they're bringing forward and stories that they heard about these different places. But often they also have a sense of a larger connection, a sense of connection beyond what they see physically. Yeah, you know, I, I have to say, you know, when I, the, these types of things, you know, you can be very overwhelmed when you see something you've read about your whole life. You know, I, like for example, I, the Mayan temple that's on the right hand side here. Um, I when I first saw it, I'd read about it, I'd seen pictures of it, but when I was actually there, it was very overwhelming because I had this knowledge that I had gained gained about it for so many years. It was similar, the, the first time I saw the Rolling Stones play a concert, it was a really similar experience because I had been um, listening to their music my whole life. And, you know, I was in my 20s and I had heard their music from the time I was very young. And, you know, I knew about, you know, all the different artists and their songs and things. But the first time they walked on stage, all of that history, all their music, everything, it all rushed back to me at the same time. 
And I had this sensation of, wow, that's the Rolling Stones. They're right in front of me. In the same way, I was overwhelmed whenever I went to this Mayan temple for the first time, because it just was an overwhelming experience because I knew so much about it. The same thing with Notre Dame. When I was there, I had the same sort of experience. And so it's all of this story, all that we've learned about these things, when we're confronted with it in life, it gives us a feeling, a connection. But these are places we know about. These are places that we've heard about, maybe we know stories about, and we have these connections, but what brings that connection to a larger sense? Makes us feel connected beyond where we are at that location. Back uh, a number of years ago, I was traveling and I went to Dallas, Texas. And um, I'd never been there before, but something about Dallas. I grew up in Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania and we have a football team there, the Steelers, and they're, they have a strong rivalry with the Dallas Cowboys who are in Dallas. And I had a little bit of a resistance to Dallas. And when I got to the city and when I was spent time there, I'd never been there before, but I kind of felt this doesn't really feel right to me. But maybe it's because of this story that I've told myself about how this football team really is, there are rivals. But I started going around the city and started to visit different places and go into different clubs and bars and with my friends. And still, it just, it never warmed up to me. I never felt any connection to that place. In fact, I actually felt a little bit of a resistance from that location. Now, what would give me this sense of resistance? How, why would this be? Well, like I said, it may be this history, this story that I've told that I told myself about their football team. But a few years later, I went to New Orleans, which is a picture here on the right, Bourbon Street. I'd never been there before. And it was my first time in the city. I went, I walked in the city and I immediately felt like I knew where I was. I didn't need maps. I could find my way around the streets. I had never, never looked at the maps and really knew where I, where, I, where I was trying to go, but I just felt like I knew where I was. I had this connection to the location. So, so as opposed to these locations, which I had read about my whole life and knew about these different places, I didn't have any connection really to these, to these uh, cities. So why was I feeling this strange resistance in Dallas and yet in New Orleans feeling this connection and this attraction, this, like I knew so much about it? What was giving me these feelings? I don't know, you know, when I, when I started looking for houses a number of years ago, I was getting, you know, the realtor was showing me a whole bunch of different houses and bringing me to different places. And I'd walk in and, you know, most people are looking, oh, I wanna make sure the kitchen's the right size. I wanna make sure the bedroom will fit, you know, I wasn't looking at that. I was, I, I was looking for a place that felt right to me, some place that I could feel good in. And you know, eventually they'd bring me to all these really modern and nice houses, but it, they never really caught me, never grabbed me. And then I walked into a place, and I was like, I feel home. I feel like I'm home here. I'm relaxed here. I'm comfortable here. This feels like my place. It was not like the other places that they'd shown me before. Now, was this because there was something about the uh, way it was set up, the rooms that were set up, and uh, what, was, what was in there that was reminding me of my homes I've had in the past? I have to say the house that I'm in now is nothing like any of the houses I've ever lived in in the past. It's completely different, has a completely different layout, different color, everything's different about it. And yet, when I walked in, I felt it. I felt this connection. Like it was something about the place, the location that grabbed me. Similar to how I felt when I went to New Orleans. I felt like I was home. I felt like there was something about this place. I don't know what it is. 
So these are the questions we start to ask when we're talking about sacred spaces and places. Are they something that is developed because of our knowledge of this location and we're confronted with it, like I was confronted with Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones, or is it something else about the location that's really kind of grabbing us? What could it be? Well, let me move on and tell you a little bit about the Ryan Research Center. Because this, um, this location in, in Durham, North Carolina, I didn't grow up here. I wasn't from this region, but I have came to this region partly, partially because the Rhine was here. Now, you, you might wonder, I'm talking about the Rhine Research Center. Why do I have Sherlock Holmes on here? And why do I have a horse and things? Well, let me tell you a little story. Back in the 1920s, um, there was a man named uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. He wrote the Sherlock Holmes mysteries. And he had been traveling around the United States. And he was in Chicago giving a talk, but he wasn't talking about Sherlock Holmes. He was talking about work that he did with the Society for Psychical Research, the SPR, in the UK. He was studying mediums and trying to understand from a scientific perspective, what are mediums and how does this work? You know, mediums at that time were, uh, you know, when you went to see a medium, people would go into, a, usually it was like a Friday night or a weekend night, and they'd go to the medium's house and they'd walk into a room and it'd be very dark and they'd be greeted at the door and led to the mediumship room, the seance room, where there might be some couple candles burning and they'd go into the room and sit around the table, hold hands, and all of a sudden, the medium would come in, shrouded in mystery, and often many shrouds as well. And they would come into the room, and when the lights got dark, they said they were communicating with spirits, and faces would appear, music would play, Coins would drop onto the table. There were many things that would occur that would just excite everyone. And it was essentially entertainment for many people. This is the way people were doing entertainment back in the early 20th century. But what Arthur Conan Doyle found is that some of them had information that they shouldn't have known. They said that they were communicating with spirits and some of them seemed to have information that indicated that they might be communicating with spirits. Well, in the audience, as he spoke in the 1920s, was this young man named J.B. Rhine. Well, J.B. Rhine heard, this, heard the, this talk and immediately went home to his wife, Louisa Rhine, who's that woman down here in the picture on the right, who was, also, who was a PhD in biology, just as J.B. was also a PhD in biology at the University of Chicago at that time, and he said, I think I found a way to combine our interests in the spirit world, in religion, and science. And he started to co contact different people who were studying uh, psychical research around the country. Uh, he ended up getting in touch with a man named uh, William McDougall, who was up at Harvard, who eventually invited JB to come to a new university in Durham back in 1927 called Duke University, where he was head of the psychology department. And he asked JB to come down and be part of his, uh, part of his, part of his uh, staff, and he could study mediumship. Well, on the way down to North Carolina, they passed a sign that said, psychic horse. Well, of course, JB saw this as, well, this is someplace I have to stop. And so he stopped with his wife, Louisa, and they went and they visited Lady the Wonder Horse, who was supposed to be psychic, who was able to not only, you know, do math, you know, they have horses that they say can do math by hitting their own, but Lady actually was able to uh, use a, a primitive keyboard and type out answers to questions and questions like, you know, where are you from? Where is this person from or where, what are they doing? Um, Lady was able to answer these questions. And Lady was also very well known for having uh, located uh, a missing boy 
by typing out where the missing boy would could be found. Uh, there were a number of different things, and JB was interested and ended up uh, doing an exploration of is this horse really psychic before and after he came to Duke University. At Duke University, after he was there for a few years and started studying mediumship, he realized really quickly, when you're trying to study mediumship, you have to determine, is this person really communicating with spirits? So for example, if I were to go to a medium and they were to tell me all about my uncle Bob who passed away a few years ago, and um, is that are they getting that information about Uncle Bob because Uncle Bob is kind of in the spirit world whispering in their ear and telling them the secrets of the spirit world? Or maybe that medium is getting the information from me, mind-to-mind -mind communication, telepathy. Or perhaps at my house, I have Uncle Bob's library, and um, in his study, uh, you know, he has a smoking jacket in there and, you know, his bowling trophies and, you know, his little gin in the bottom drawer and things. And perhaps the medium is able to get information about that from a distance. Clairvoyance. Getting information about objects from a distance. Or maybe in about half an hour, I'm going to tell the medium all about Uncle Bob all about you know his history and what he's done and maybe the medium's able to see this through time precognition so jb recognized that before he could determine whether the medium was speaking to a spirit he first had to find out hey is telepathy possible mind to mind communication is clairvoyance or remote viewing is this possible to get information about objects from a distance and is getting information from the future or through time is that possible so he started to design tests and they use these cards that you can see here in the middle with the star and the plus and the wavy lines, um, the ESP cards. They were invented by a man named Carl Zener for psychology tests at Duke University. Um, Carl Zener never liked the fact that they were used exclusively for ESP tests. So JB always called them ESP test cards. And so that's what I'm gonna do also. But he invented these and started to do tests for telepathy, clairvoyance, and precognition. After a few years, he published some a uh, book in 1934 called Extrasensory Perception, which in the United States really formulated exactly what the field of parapsychology would entail and defined the, what ESP was and provided a lot of information to the public. So this is kind of the history of the Rhine Research Center. And it, the labs were at Duke University from 1935 until 1965 for 30 years. That's JB in the middle there with a couple of the, with Gaither Pratt and um, and Charlie, I'm sorry, I can't remember his last name. Those were the original researchers from the Rhine Research Center. But the reason I have this slide in here is because it wasn't just the research that was being done at the Rhine, but it was so exciting that people from all over the world started to come to the lab to meet JB. They were drawn to the lab. And up here on the left is Eileen Garrett, who's a fam very famous medium, probably the most famous medium of the 20th century. And there's a couple of guys at Sparrow Ives and Eddie Albert who were some entertainers. They were singers who came to the lab. But there were many, many people who came to the lab from different parts of the world because they were so intrigued that someone was actually studying these things in a very scientific way. Even down here on the right, you can see that's Timothy Leary, who was famous for doing uh, LSD research. He was a, a psych psychologist, psychiatrist, who was doing research on LSD and its effects on the mind. It's not a well-known story, but he even came to the lab in the 1960s when LSD was still a legal drug. And they did some, they tried to do some testing with ESP and LSD back in the 1960s. And well, let's just say, it didn't really work out so well because people who are doing LSD, they don't always follow directions very well. <laughs> so they weren't able to really control the experiments as much as they might have wanted to. But my point is that there were a lot of people that were attracted 
to the work that was done there, and they came to the lab almost as if it were a pilgrimage to come to this location to learn more about what was happening there, to meet JB and to understand what was going on at the lab. Well, after 1965, um, JB had to retire from Duke University, and um, you can read a lot more about this if you look in the um, the uh, Australian Institute's newsletter from last month, because I wrote a lot about this in there. But they started the Foundation for Research on the Nature of Man, which was just a uh, nonprofit that moved off campus that continued to do research in parapsychology for a number of years. And again, people were coming from all over the place. They had a, a summer study program where they would teach people about parapsychology and how to become and study these phenomena that we're all interested in. Um, so again, people coming to this location because there was something about it that was stirring them up and getting them interested in what was happening here. Well, today we're still a nonprofit. We have a whole bunch of different people. Some of you might recognize some of the people in this picture. Down in the bottom left, uh, this is Susan Freeman, who's our assistant director at the Rhine, and Sally Rhine Feather, who is the person who's been involved in parapsychology more than anyone else because she was there from the beginning. <laughs> she was there whenever parapsychology started. She's J.B. Ryan's daughter. And she's still, she's 92 years old. Is she 92? I don't, well, she will be 92. And she's still at the at the Ryan. She still comes to a lot of our events and participates in our research meetings and things. And there's some other researchers here, but the point is that there's still a lot of activity at the Rhine and people do come from different places to come to the Rhine to really learn about what we're doing there. When we do things like, for example, there's a library at the Rhine, it's the Alex Tannis Library. Some of you may be familiar with Alex Tannis. If you're not, he's a really interesting person. You might look him up. Um, but in the library, we have research meetings there. We have uh, different groups that meet there. And we have a lot of books and journals. We probably have, oh, probably about six, six to 7,000 different journals, art, archives, and books uh, there. And people, when they come there, they just feel this sense of the history of the location. They feel connected to JB and his previous work. They really feel this very strong draw to be there. So that's within the library. But we also have a number of labs set up. One of them is the Gonsfeld lab. Some of you are very familiar with the Gonsfeld, so I'll just summarize it really quickly. Um, the Gonsfeld is a, uh, it's a different, it's a process and a procedure, a methodology that was created by Charles Honerton um, back in the 1970s and through the 80s. And if you look at the picture in the center there, that's Charles Honerton on the left and Stan Krippner on the right. And in the center is something that they called the witch's cradle. And what they did at that time is they were, they were working under the premise that there's ESP information around us all the time, but it's always drowned out by the noise of our normal senses, by all the activity, all the things we hear and see, and just our normal thoughts, our busy thoughts, but by quieting our senses, quieting the noise, it will allow the signal to come through more strongly. So what they would do with the witch's cradle is they would put someone in this contraption and they'd um, strap them in, as you can see here, they'd cover his eyes up and cover his ears up with big you know, headphones um, and then uh, kind of levitate this in the air and let it start spinning around a bit. And they figured that this would give them a sense that they were floating a uh, and they that they would have less sensory input and so they so imagine this all right they take someone they strap them into this thing they put them in, in the, they float them up in the air start spinning them around and then they'd say okay be psychic <laughs> um not the most conducive way to really get someone to be psychic and chuck honerton he saw this and he said let's see if we can refine this a bit more and what he did is he began to develop this technique called the Gonsfeld. What it is, is it's a um, closed in room, which is the sound, it's a sound attenuated. It's not soundproof, but it's sound attenuated. So you don't hear a lot of things from outside. You put these big 1970s headphones on and they play what they call pink noise through it. 
white noise is kind of staticky. Pink noise sounds more like waves. It's a little more relaxing, but it blocks out your hearing. And you can't hear much in this room anyway. They would put half ping pong balls over <laughs> people's eyes and shine a red light on them in order to kind of stop their visual field, stop their auditory field. And they'd put them in this really comfortable chair, this big recliner we, that you have. And by doing all of this, we're, they're reducing the amount of sensory input, reducing the noise in the room and that and, and in the experience and trying to induce a bit of an altered state of consciousness. They would have someone in this state, once they got them very relaxed, they would say, okay, start speaking about whatever comes to mind, stream of consciousness. In the meantime, in another room, far down the hallway, they'd have somebody looking at videos, looking at photographs, looking at pictures, whatever, and trying to send information about them to the person who is in the receiver's room, who's receiving the information supposedly in speaking stream of consciousness. So they did this in order to test and see if people were, if this was conducive to ESP performance. And they found, yes, that typically instead of people getting what they would expect, about 25% accuracy in these tests, they were getting closer to 33% accuracy, which might not seem like much, but that's one out of three instead of one out of four. That's a big difference statistically. And it shows that something about this experiment actually helped people to perform better in ESP tests. Well, we have a Gonsfeld room at the Rhine. And when people go into this room, they we close the door. And one of the things about it is it's a metal room. There's metal walls and ceiling. It not only blocks out things acoustically, but it also blocks out electronic noise as well. Your phones don't work in there, for example. When people go in that room and they sit in that chair, they don't want to leave. They get really comfortable. Something about that space has given them a sense that this is a place that's comfortable. I want to be here. I want to stay here. Could it be the fact that it's blocking out the electrical signals, that it's quiet, it's kind of separating them from the noises? Could it be about things that have gone on in that room? We have another lab at the Rhine called the Bioenergy Lab. And uh, Joyce mentioned this a little earlier. The Bioenergy Lab is where we actually me measure the subtle energies of the human body. Animals too sometimes, but mostly with humans right now. Back in 1970s, uh, the man named Fritz Pop from over in Germany uh, started to look at fruits and vegetables that were grown organically and that were not grown organically and was looking at differences between them, but looking at differences in light that was coming from them. Light in the ultraviolet range, something that was named in 1923 by a man named Alan Gershwitz as biophotons. Biophotons are just ultraviolet light emissions. But what Fritz Pop found is that these organically grown fruits and vegetables had a different light pattern than ones that weren't grown organically. But it wasn't only fruits and vegetables, wasn't only plants, but also animals, including people. And even single cells would have a different light signature. Now, why this is crazy stuff. Who cares about light? What's the difference? You know, what why would anybody care about light? But what Fritz Pop found is that this continued in under different states. People would produce different amounts of light from their body. Well, at the Rhine, we have what's called this the Bioenergy Lab, which is an extremely dark room. It's a really dark room painted in black so within another dark room, separated from the outside light because we're trying to measure such low levels of light. This little machine that's like the blue box there up on the right, that's what we call a photomultiplier tube. The photomultiplier tube is an engineering instrument. It's used in physics and laser technology and engineering and also medical uh, uh, practices. It can measure a single photon of light 
every half second. Really, really sensitive equipment. So that's why we have to keep the room so dark. When I have that room dark and I have this, this equipment running and I'm monitoring how much light is in the room, I'll, some t- I'll see usually about three to five photons a second. Three to five photons, it's like no light, really, really dark. If I bring a person in, doesn't matter who it is, anybody, and sit them in the room, that number jumps from three to five photons up to about 12 to 20 photons a second because we glow, all of us. We all have a natural glow in the ultraviolet range. But it's not only people, as I was mentioning before, it's animals, and we even took red blood cells. And if you put a little bit of saline on them, they pop. As the red blood cells would pop, we'd start to see light being emitted from the blood cells. So any organic matter produces this light. Sounds crazy, right? This isn't parapsychology. This is biology. Back in 1970, when Fritz Pop started, it was crazy. Nobody cared. No one really paid much attention. But now, 50 years later, this work is being studied at um, MIT, at Stanford, in Japan, in Italy, all around the world in upper level biology courses. They're trying to understand where does this light come from? What's the purpose? What does it do? They find it in in, uh, different organs in the body. They find it in the brain. And they don't know why this light is being produced or where it comes from. Uh, If you read Wikipedia, they'll tell you some stories on where it comes from, but there's no scientific agreement on exactly where this light comes from. But this is biology. So what are we doing at the Rhine? (laughs) We bring in different people who have different different sorts of abilities. For example, um, Ed Edwards is there on the bottom left and he claims to be a healer. We don't test these people to see if they're healers, but he claims to be a healer. Um, We bring in people who are meditators, been doing meditation a lot of years. We bring in people who are martial artists. Uh, The woman up top on the left uh, is uh, Shirley Black and she uh, she does PK work. She actually can affect things with her intention. And so we bring these people and we bring them in the lab. And first thing we do is we get a straight baseline with them. When we say, don't do anything, just stay here. Like I said, about 12 to 20 photons from most people. But we get a baseline. And then we say, start your healing, start your meditation, start your martial arts. Whatever you do, start doing it now. And we look for variations in light during their periods of focus. About 90% of the sessions we do, we get nothing. We just continue to see the baseline through the whole session. But in about 10% of the sessions, we see variance in the light in the room. 12 to 20 photons is a baseline. It'll jump up to 80. That's four times the baseline. That's a big difference. But we often see it jump up into hundreds, 300, 500, into the thousands. And some people have actually brought it into the hundreds of thousands of photons a second, even over a million photons a second. You don't need statistics to know that there's something unusual going on in that room. Now, why do we care about this light? Why do we, why do we mention it? Well, first of all, because this is a natural phenomenon. And when you talk to people who are doing healing, they often talk about uh, looking at blockages in the body and trying to remove blockages and allow the energy to flow more freely through the body. You talk to martial artists, they talk about chi and the life force energy in the body. You talk to he- or talk to meditators, oftentimes they discuss the kundalini rising through the body. You talk to all of these, they're all talking about energies. You talk to a physicist and a physicist is going to say, look, there's potential energy and kinetic energy and You're not talking about either one of those, so I don't know what you're talking about. But what we're measuring is light. Light is an electromagnetic energy. It's recognized by the traditional sciences, and we're using a photomultiplier tube, which is a standard instrument used in physics and uh, medical technology to measure this. So we're using standard instruments to measure a standard quantity 
in seeing variances in these quantities when certain people are focusing their intention, when they're trying to move what they are perceiving as energy. So the question is, are we starting to find the energy behind healing? Are we starting to find the energy behind chi? Is it a form of light? Well, let me move on for a sec to healing research. I'm going to kind of step back. There was, um, back in the 1960s, there was a man named Bernard Grad who was doing some work. He had met this Hungarian uh, healer who was uh, with the Hungarian army who discovered that he, while he was on a battlefield, by touching people, he could heal them and make them feel better. Well, Bernard Grad was very impressed with what he saw, and they set up this experiment called a telekinetic effect on plant growth. Bernard Grad was an excellent methodologist, really top notch, really good. And what they did is they had Oscar Escabani, they had him treat water. And by using that water to water plants, trying to see if what he did to the water had some sort of effect on how the plants would grow. As I said, Bernard Grad was so such a great, great designer for experiments that his experiments were extremely convincing that the water that was treated by Estebani caused the plants to grow more, more quickly. They produced more mass. They were more healthy than the plants that were watered with water that he didn't treat. As if the water was holding some sort of effect from his energetic treatment. But not only did he do this with water in these experiments, and you can read this, it's, I think it's in the International um, Journal of Parapsychology in 1963 and 64, he did a couple of different things. He did one with mice too, but I'm not gonna talk about that one today. <laughs> but um, he also, um, Estebani also treated cotton and stored what he what he termed stored his energy in the cotton. And then would they would use this cotton and apply it to people who were ill and they would feel healing effects. They would start to see healing effects. Now Bernard Grad didn't test the he wasn't a medical professional as I am not either. And so he didn't test to see if it was really a healing effect that was going on but he did see effects with the water and the plant growth. Now, this is kind of a sidetrack, but I brought that up because at the Rhine, we also have some healing research going on. And there's a man here up on the left named Bill Bankston who has followed up with Bernard Grad's work. And he has extended it and developed his, a different healing treatment, a different methodology, and following similar methodologies that Bernard Grad was using is able to, was able to demonstrate amazing results in very controlled studies including studies where he was working with mice and uh, the mice being injected with cancer cells normally they would die within 28 to 30 days all of them the mice that were treated using the healing method that bill was using they didn't die none of them died. they continued to live not only this, but after they were treated, if they were reinjected with cancer cells, they could not, they were not reinfected with cancer again. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about this because you can learn a lot about Bill in different places. But Bill's method, a number of people at the Rhine came together and we started a healing group. And you can see the picture of, there, of us there. There's seven of us, there's eight of us in the group now. But we've been working together now for, it's coming up on 10 years, meeting weekly for almost 10 years. I don't know about you, but getting a group that can meet weekly consistently for 10 years and still have the same people together, that's just a, an achievement in and of itself. But we worked together and we practiced this healing method and learned about this method that he calls cycling and learned to practice it. That why do I have that picture of that little conference room? That is the conference room at the Rhine where the healing team meets. And we met there with the exception of the last two years. We met in that room consistently every week. 
and we would bring people in and we'd set them up uh, on a little, we'd put some padding on the table and some clean sheets and we had them on the table and we would do healing treatments with them in the terms of trying to do research to see what the effects of the healing were, the healing efforts were, what the experience of the of being part of a healing session was, and whether people were seeing any benefits from this method that, that had been created. We did this independent of Bill Bankston because we didn't want him to really, he had been involved in all the other studies up to the point that we had started, and so we wanted to do something independent. Well, the reason I'm showing this room is because now, after all of this time of meeting in this room, when people come to the Rhine and they go in this room for a meeting, not realizing the healing team, not knowing anything about what has gone on in this room, they feel good in this room. They talk about how they feel so, how well how they feel really nice around this table. They just really feel good here. Is there something about the activities that went on in that room that might be causing these people to feel better in this location? Could there be something about this space and what has gone on in this space before that they're feeling that is causing them to enjoy their time there? Now, why would we possibly believe, I'll go back for just one second, that a table could hold energy? Is there any scientific research that would tell you that a table could hold healing energy or something of this nature and that people would feel it, that it would have an effect on people? Why would, why would anyone believe this? Well, <laughs> this is Graham Watkins. And back in 1970s, he was working with the lab, the Ryan Lab, the Institute for Parapsychology. And he was working with mice. And Graham's a zoologist. He would anesthetize the mice and try to have healers wake them up. He was working with them under very carefully controlled conditions. Talking to Graham, he still comes to our research meetings at the Ryan. He discussed how ether that he was using as the anesthesia essentially poisons the mice for a period of time until they work it through their system. So he had it's a, um, a situation set up where he would have two mice. They were equally anesthetized on either side of a screen and have a healer on another side of a window. Randomly, the healer would be chosen to heal the mouse on the right or the one on the left and try to see if they could wake that mouse up more quickly than the one than the other one. Well, in their studies, they found yes, the healers were able to wake the mice up. It was a very carefully controlled trial, working with well-known healers to people who had been known to have effects before, and the healers woke the mice up more quickly, which he interpreted as healing them of this poison that had been put into their body. But what they discovered was not only that this happened while the healers were focusing, but that after the session was over and the healer was gone out of the room, wasn't even around anymore, if they put mice in the same location where the healer was focusing, if the healer was focusing on the left, the mouse that was on the left that was anesthetized would wake up even though it wasn't being treated by the healer, would wake up more quickly than the other mouse on the other side. As if there was a lingering healing effect at that location. Now, Graham considered this to be a continued effect of the healing focus that had been uh, maintained at that location. And he saw this, and he saw that it lasted about 30 minutes and that eventually it would wear off. But that lingering effect of the healing seemed to, seemed to maintain at that location. Well, I've worked with Graham quite a bit since then. In fact, we've worked on some PK um, psychokinetic studies together. And with that woman, Shirley Black, I showed you a little bit ago, um, we found that we were working with an instrument called the Eggly Wheel and trying to get her to spin this wheel. Well, we found that after she had worked with this wheel and she was actually causing this wheel to spin in a very contained environment, that um, after she stopped, the wheel would continue to want to spin in the same direction as when she was treating it. 
In fact, if we stopped the wheel and spun it the other way with our finger, it would come to a stop naturally and then start spinning back in the opposite direction again, as if it were rebounding, Follow, as if there was a continuing effect on the device. So when I talked to Graham about this, we determined that it didn't seem that the effect was in the location, but that the effect was actually on the object. When he was working with the mice, they were on aluminum trays. It was as if the aluminum tray was maintaining the healing, as if there were objects that were holding this healing energy, just like the water that Estebani was treating, just like the cotton that was treated and that Bill Bankston is working with now where he treats cotton as well. It seems that this healing energy is maintained in objects. So when we're talking about these spaces and these sacred spaces, rather than being sense of our memory, could it be that there is a lingering effect on the place based on activity that has occurred there that is continuing to provide that sense of comfort to people? Could it provide a mechanism to create sacred spaces and sacred objects? Or could it be the community? Could it be that it, it's all about the community? These are different things that happen at the Rhine, but could it be it's all about the community, about the energies the community brings to that location and what the feelings that are brought there that are stored in objects at that location so that when people go to those locations, they continue to feel the sense of connection. Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys getting up so early to come here and listen to me. I might be a little overly enthusiastic. I'm happy to be here and I'm really excited about this, um, about this opportunity. And um, it is a little later in the evening, so I apologize if I'm a little more perky than you might be early in the morning. Thanks a lot. Thank you, John. I, I think you were very perky throughout the whole presentation. <laughs> Wow, that was so, that's fascinating. Uh, I think the Rhine Centre is um, fast becoming a sacred space itself. Makes me want to go there. <laughs> Anyone got any questions? Just put yeah, your... Yeah, I'm happy to jump in, oh, Joyce. Uh, yep, yeah, Russ. Yeah, thanks very much for that. I'm, I'm just wondering, um, John, if... Um, there could be some kind of a double blind experiment that you could conduct where somebody is led randomly into a place which is acknowledged, recognized by people as a sacred space, and then some random other place with collection where there's just a random collection of furniture that has no energy associated with it. Uh, and then, you know, conduct that a number of times and then start to see uh, how people respond. Have you, have you um, considered doing something like that? Well, you know, I was talking about objects holding energy, right? And rooms are really big objects, right? Mm -hmm. Houses are big objects. And, you know, these big landmarks are just big objects as well. So if they're holding these energies, you should be able to test it that way. Yeah. Um, Russ, I like the way you're thinking. It's, I think it's a little bit complex to be able to isolate something and say, oh, that's not holding any, any energy. <laughs> Um, so it might be hard to find the control objects, but there. What, but what it about, seems like it. What, what but it seems it would new, be a possibility. What about some furniture or a room that was brand new manufactured? So you wouldn't expect it to have any residual energy left over from anywhere. I think where I would I would probably lean towards. I, I mean, I think I think you're right on right on track here. But where I would probably lean towards is having two very similar types of locations. And having one location that has a well-established healer or group or something spend a lot of time in one of them and not in the other to see if they can actually charge that. The similar to way with Barnard Grad, how they charged the water and used other water that wasn't charged and then did something with them to see if people, if, um, if it would affect the plants. Well, we could see if it would affect people as well. So that does sound like a reasonable way to go with it. And I would... Back you 100% if you wanted to do that kind of study. <laughs> oh, I was waiting for your research paper to come out. Ah, uh, yeah, I have other ones in the works. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Thank so you. I think there might be a study where that was done. 
with a control environment, but I, I can't recall it, but it, it seems to jump into my mind from somewhere. Uh, I'll have a look at, look for you. Um, John, you had Hi, a Lance. picture of the uh, chakra, or not the chakras, but you had a, a, an image there of a guy meditating. And yes. um, the chakras are often associated with different colors. And mm -hmm. um, like orange is the stomach, I think, and then you, you just go through the spectrum. Uh, do you think there's uh, a possibility of measuring the different chakras and getting bio photons from those different uh, levels, uh, so that so that we can associate some sort of truth to those those traditional colors? So, um, what I found, Lance, and as I said, I came from like a long tradition of healers, and I've been studying it for many years in different ways. And what I've found is that the colors associated with chakras vary drastically depending upon the author <laughs> and depending upon the method and technique. Um, I think it, uh, my, my perspective is that it has uh, a lot to do with the interpretation of the person who's, who's experiencing it. There definitely seem to be energy centers at certain locations on the body. And for example, esoteric healing talks about different, uh, different energy chakras and minor chakras and major chakras at different points. Um, and, there would be uh, value, and in fact, um, Beverly Rubick, who's in uh, California, has done some studies where they've looked at specific chakra locations to see if there was biophotons, ultraviolet light coming from these locations during certain practices. And she has seen that certain locations tend to have more of an effect uh, or see, tend to radiate more light during certain activities. Um, we haven't done that at the Rhine yet. We haven't moved to a point where we're looking at specific locations, but there does seem to be a value in looking at different points and seeing when people are doing different types of focus is more light produced in different locations. Um, in terms of different colors, we're pretty focused on ultraviolet light because this has been discovered around people. We don't really, when we're in these really dark rooms, filtering out for other types of colored light, we, there's no indication in biology that these other spectrums really have such strong power as the as the ultraviolet light does from organic matter yeah i'm wondering whether within the ultraviolet spectrum uh there are harmonics harmonics that could be associated you know so that you could i don't know if there's like seven layers or you know like like when you measure brain frequencies they have these ranges Alpha, beta, right. and so on, but there actually ranges for those um, labels. I'm just wondering if you know you, we could sort of break down the ultraviolet spectrum into different ranges like that. Yes, and so that what the instrument we have actually measures quantity of photons. It doesn't measure the spectrum. It's right. filtered for ultraviolet light, but you'd need a spectrometer. Uh, to do that. And um, the spectrometers that I've spoken to some people who do aerospace type of work, and they talk about using spectrometers to for the stars to oh. determine what they're made of, what they're, um, and that is kind of the level of technology that would be appropriate yeah. in this situation. Um, I don't know about your research funds, but mine aren't quite up to that level of aerospace yet. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> Big bucks involved. Yes, maybe in yeah. the future. We maybe we can get Bigelow involved with that yeah. at some point. Yes, he'd be the guy. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can I? Uh, oh, can I just? Not, sorry. Oh, oh, I just, want to ask a question as well. Yep. Go ahead, Vlad, and then Rob. Oh, I was just going to make a suggestion. In, instead of spending a lot of money on a spectrometer like like that, um, potential for just to use some filters, literally certain certain range of spectral filters and, and cycle through those during an experiment might give you a, a just a rough idea of of the the spectrum um yeah that's just just yeah, a that's right, because we already know there's different levels of uv uh, and right. and uh, one will burn you in australia it's a big problem with skin cancer mm -hmm. so yes. I, I think there's uv1 and uv2 and i know in photography you have different uv filters uh, so there, there obviously is a range. It's in, just finding that. In, in photonics, you, you, can, you can get lots of different filters um, to right. filter out. Yeah. So we're looking at near, near UV 
about we we peak at about 380 nanometers so that's we're close to the visible range mm -hmm. if you start going far uv that's where you start getting the um dangerous uv things that will blind you things that, and um since we're looking at healers and looking at people and and that we're, we're looking at something that's going to heal rather than harm <laughs> for the most that's our goal here um besides i'm 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 hesitant to you know un unlike people like bernard grad who was actually harming animals or bill bankston who was giving mice cancer i i don't want to harm anyone <laughs> i, I want to i want people to be healthier and happier so um we haven't gone into looking at different different levels even within the uv range even near uv there's different levels as well but and, but you need a very sensitive you need very sensitive equipment to tell whether you're at 380 nanometers versus 350 versus 300 and if you start getting lower than that or then you're starting to really get into the danger range yeah. thanks rob you wanted to ask a question yeah can you hear me yes okay mm -hmm. um i suppose the opposite of sacred places where um you feel good is if you go to a haunted house that's been haunted for a very long time mm -hmm. as soon as you walk in there it feels bad and you don't want to be there you want to get out there as quickly as you can so we've noticed with research over time that uh, it's only psychic people that have psychic experiences so if you were not psychic you could live in a haunted house and be oblivious to the fact so it's only people that are psychic that become aware that when they're in the haunted house it affects their thoughts mood and behavior um, they feel depressed mm -hmm. and anxious and when they leave the house they notice a difference so that's just another element of this energy now when uh, the good spooks and i have psychically cleared the house the energy changes completely and people comment on it how the house feels so good now yes very much and and you know i had that i had that you know ooh kind of experience when i went to dallas but that's a whole different story <laughs> um but you know but yes and you know i i work with lloyd auerbach a lot uh lloyd and i communicate quite regularly and he's done a lot of investigations and one of the things that he discussed a great deal um rob is that that, that you have to look at the environment around the building as well um because it, it's possible if it's under power lines where there's a strong magnetic field that can affect people if there's uh if even if the foundation is a little off and the rooms aren't quite square that can affect how people feel within the rooms and things so it, there's a lot of traditional physical activity that can cause people to feel funny too and this is one of the things when we're when we're looking at these sacred spaces we always have to look at what sort of physical things might have an effect for example paul Devereaux did some work uh, with sound with acoustics yeah. and he, he found that some of the more traditional sacred sites oftentimes had resonance at 111 hertz of sound um, so I, i'm not an expert on the sound technology but you have to look at all of the different potential physical activity before we would immediately jump to oh you know there's some sort of energy is being stored here um but but i've had that same experience that you're discussing where having a space that feels to be cleared gives you a different feeling afterwards john did you get to when you said you the house you purchased is this the house you're living in now and it's where I'm, I'm in the bedroom right now yeah well, uh, i'm not going to turn the camera around so you can no. see the rest but this <laughs> did, you get, did you get to the bottom of it i mean I, I had the same issue with my house um, when I was house hunting and uh, I always came back to this one. Yes. And, and I would sit there and just look at it from the road. Right. And I'd check out the houses and they didn't, there was no vibe. And now yes. I've been in this house over 30 years. So I, I, it's like destiny. Like, you know what I mean? Um, it's a peculiar yes. thing. It may be geodesics. It may, it may be the, the energy that's in that area, like ley lines or something. It's, well, it's, it's hard to pinpoint where it's coming from. Well, you know, I'm, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll wrap this up quickly, Joy, I'm, Joyce, I'm not going to hold it on. But, you know, when I moved into this house, after I'd been here for a brief period of time, uh, I started to look at uh, feng shui. And I realized that the man who had lived here before had laid out the entire garden and the location with feng shui, 
feng shui principles. And it may be that that's what just made me feel so comfortable when I walked in, that I was being sensitive to it. It just felt right to me. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I've Lance, I've had a lot of different unusual experiences in this location that we can talk about another time. <laughs> Yeah, that will take a long time. There's a lot of things that have, that I could talk to you about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds interesting, John. Have you ever, um, I guess, funding, you know, needing funding, but um, have you ever really wanted to measure the, the energy of, like, say, the pyramids, like the, the famous ancient sacred sites? Um, do you think there's opportunities for that or just too much noise? Um, well, yeah, I'd love to travel around the world to sacred sites and just explore them all. Um, Paul Devereaux, actually, as I mentioned before, he did this with acoustics. Mm -hmm. And when I, in fact, when I went to the Mayan temple that I showed you in the early part, they designed a great deal of their structures are acoustically based. Oh. Um, they, in fact, they have uh, these ball courts that they used for different sports that they did. And uh, their stages separated by over 100 meters from each other and from the way that it's set up, a whisper on one end can be heard at the other end in certain locations. So you can have conversations over a hundred meter away in a very low speaking voice. Wow. So yes, so Paul Devereaux did this and was looking at, at acoustics. It would be great to, if we could measure the energies, but you know, the energy I'm measuring in my lab right now is ultraviolet light, which has to be done in a really, really dark environment. I don't really know how to do that and, or you know what is this energy this is always the question we're, we're playing with and trying to figure out what is the energy and if we could figure out what that is and how to detect it at different locations or on different objects that would be very interesting mm -hmm. um so if you ever get a couple tickets around the world and want to invite me i'd be happy to explore this topic with you <laughs> sure <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, yeah, one more question. Anyone just raise your virtual hand? You go to the reactions tab at the bottom and raise your hand. Any no more questions? So um John, you've so you can follow, we can follow you on Twitter, the Ryan ESP. That's on, on Twitter and yeah, yes, um uh, Yep, Facebook and YouTube as yes. well. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I, Twitter. Twitter is more where I make announcements of different events we have, but you'll see more activity if you if you look on other social media sites, and uh, if you go to Ryan.org, you can find okay. a lot of information there about what we do. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. Liz. Thank you, John. Yeah. And thanks for Thank inviting you. me, Lance. <laughs> Thank you so much for um yeah giving us um your time and energy. <laughs> For this fascinating talk great thank you john and um yeah hopefully um i'd love to go to the ryan center one day right. please come you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you